Hey, everybody. Welcome or welcome back to the May, how did it get to be May already, meeting of the Scarlet Quill Society. Um, I'm Rowan. I will be your guide through the wonderful world of developmental editing this month. Um, I should take a moment to shamelessly plug the fact that in a couple of months, you are going to get to see some people who are not just me, which is great for you and great for me. Um, we have a really exciting panel coming up in July, I think, July, on uh, sensitivity reading, why you need it, what you can get out of it, how to find a reader, um, all the, all the nitty gritty from some very experienced sensitivity readers who I have a tremendous amount of respect for um, in the business, um, who are also big old nerds, which is great. Um, Later in the year, we're going to have some nonfiction editors, some other pro editors come in. Um, we're going to round table. We're going to talk about cleaning up your work, uh, the nitty gritty, how much is enough, how much is too much, um, and just some stuff that we as editors think of when we're looking at a story that if you haven't been editing very long is maybe stuff that you haven't thought of. And if you have been editing for a while, you're going to get a lot of affirmation, I think, um, later in the year from that round table. So, um, you know, stay tuned, hang out, and uh, and we'll see you then. Um, but back to May, um, we're talking about developmental editing, which we've kind of been touching base with for the whole year, if you think about it. Um, you know, what goes into a story? What ingredients are you bringing in? Your forest, your trees? Um, developmental editing is more like, oh, you know, you've got your world is built, you've got your forest, you've got your trees, you've got your this, you've got your that. Developmental editing is the architecture of your house. If your story or memoir or novel or thesis, um, not that I've got theses on the brain, but definitely editing a couple of those as we creep up to the end of the academic year. Um, if that's a house, then developmental editing is when you walk through and you look at the blueprints. Do the walls meet? Does the ceiling, you know, not fall on your head? Is this a load-bearing house? Could somebody walk in here and live here? And in a couple of months, when we're talking about copy editing and line editing, we're going to talk about all of the different things that basically get that house up to code, right? Like we're coming through, we're inspecting, we're making sure that all of the pipes are actually welded um, or whatever you do with plastic pipes, you glue them. Um, I should know this. I literally just redid my bathroom. Um, but right now we're asking, will this beam support this house? Uh, are these blueprints solid? Is this even valid? Or are you looking at something that's like Escher, where you've got like, here's a staircase and there's a staircase or, you know, the end of Labyrinth, if y'all have seen Labyrinth, um, which I feel like is like a classic movie now, which is basically vaguely horrifying because that was my entire childhood and now I'm officially old. But um, that kind of, of thing, right? Like you don't, you don't necessarily want to be writing that loop unless you're doing it intentionally. If you're doing it intentionally, great. You are an editorial nightmare, but hopefully you did it right in the first place. <laughs> um, so there's a couple of things that are really important in dev editing. Um, and I'm going to say dev editing this whole time because nobody wants to say developmental. I am going to start talking over myself. This is my second energy drink today, and um, there's no way that I'm going to be able to accurately pronounce developmental 400 times in 60 minutes. So bear with me. It's dev edits. When you do your dev edits, these are legitimately the hardest edits to communicate to an author. See my deliberate pause to let that sink in? They're the hardest. This is the worst thing that you're ever going to have to say to an author. If you can get through the developmental edit stage with, with the author that you're working with, y'all can do anything. Sorry about the gross noise. The dog is just going to be like that. She's got this huge bowl of water that she's slurping out of, and she's a Weimaraner, and she doesn't really close her mouth. Um, <laughs> she's great. Yes, I love you. You're a good dog. Um, 
so yeah, there's there's seven animals in this house, and I am all alone. My spouse had a little family emergency this month, so um, I don't know how wild it's going to get in here. If the kittens wake up, it's going to be a lot. <laughs> Bear with me. So hardest thing to talk to the author about because these are the points where you have to look at somebody, you look them in the eye in the Zoom, um, in your comments, and tell them that their story doesn't work and that they need to rewrite it and that they need to throw away some things that they're really emotionally attached to. And nobody likes to do that. Like, I'm a writer, you're a writer, we don't like to do that. Um, so when you are communicating with your author, keep that in mind. Please, please keep that in mind. That is a human being who cares about the thing that you're about to say is trash. Um, I'm using the word trash very advisedly. It may not be bad. It might not be a bad idea or bad writing, but it is trash in that we need to delete it from the story. We need to remove it from this world and, um, and make room for something that actually supports the story they're trying to write. And maybe that can be the underpinning for a different story. Um, and maybe it can't, you know, maybe it isn't a good idea, but it's an idea that they had that came from them, hopefully, came from them. I know we're all reading about like huge plagiarism stories in the news lately. Um, but ideally, <laughs> this idea came from that writer and they're going to be very sensitive about it. Um, so respect that as an editor. Um, even if you hate the thing, like be gentle about the way that you hate it. <laughs> um, be gentle about this idea doesn't support your story, not I don't like this idea. For one thing, I don't like it is not a valid reason to get rid of something. I think this could be stronger is a valid reason to get rid of something. Um, I don't think that this goes anywhere with the story that you're trying to tell. I don't think this character's behavior is in line with what you need. Um, all of these are valid reasons. I don't like it. I don't, nobody cares if you like the story, right? You're, you're the editor. You don't have to like it. If you genuinely hate it, you need to sit with yourself for a minute and take some time to figure out what you're responding to in the story that you hate. Do you just hate that genre? Do you hate, are you editing somebody's wedding vows and you don't believe in the institution of marriage? Um, are you editing somebody's, kid sick and you don't have any children, you don't like children, you don't want to be around children, and this is just excruciating for you, walk away. Please let that person get an editor that is going to be able to enjoy that story. Um, please let that person get an editor who is going to be a good editor for that story and an enthusiastic editor for that story. Um, there are other reasons to dislike stories. <laughs> Some of those reasons are they're using exhausting racist tropes. They're not doing anything new, but they're trying to be shocking. This is just like a meaningless gore fest. Everybody dies at the end. Um, I, I keep leaning on that, and, and I should definitely say again that horror is one of my favorite genres. I read a lot of horror. I watch a lot of horror. Um, I, my parents didn't have a lot of sense that there were things that were appropriate or inappropriate for small children to watch. So like I grew up with Army of Darkness <laughs> um, as one of my foundational movies that we watched over and over again. Um, you know, you, you, this is my boomstick, <laughs> you know, the blood flying everywhere. Um, you, boobs in your face, spurting intestines, all of these things. Um, and and I, like, I enjoy them. So when I say this horror story is tired and exhausting and it's just trying to be shocking, please know that I am not coming at this from a place of somebody who just cannot appreciate good horror. I am coming at this from a place of someone who wants to be horrified if you're going to write horror. Um, somebody who wants to feel that 
creeping terror as you move in slow motion with somebody coming up behind you, right? Um, so, again, um, reasons to dislike a story. I'm going to kind of set that aside. Um, and I set it aside in the post, too, because I do want everybody to, to come to the July panel. Um, I think it would be a lot of fun if we had good attendance for that. But, um, but also, like, I want to talk about that sort of yikes factor with more people who are going to flesh that out better for you, um, who are going to be able to share different perspectives on that. Because I'm, you know... <laughs> You see me, right? Like, there's there's only so much I can do when I say, like, oh, that feels pretty racist. Like, I don't have the lived experience to say why, necessarily. And I don't have the lived experience to spot a story that's exhausting because it's this sort of constant fetishization of, um, of the things that you're writing about if you're writing about a culture that is not mine. Um, so... I am setting the yikes factor for I didn't like this story aside. Um, if that is the reason that you don't like the story, it's still a good reason to stop dead editing it and say, hey, I think this might need a sensitivity read before we get into the edits. Um, I know somebody that you can like maybe call and shoot them you know, 25 bucks to have coffee with them and just buy like half an hour of their time and talk through your story idea and talk about what you're writing. And they can give you some ideas for how to do that um, without stepping on some of the things that I think you're stepping on. So that's, that's the thing. You can do that early and often. Um, and you should, especially, especially if you're writing about things that you don't have lived experience in. Talk to people whose lived experience it is talk to, you know, read people whose lived experience it is. There are tons and tons and tons of writers just putting it all out there on the net right now. And take advantage of that. For God's sake, take advantage of that. Internalize some of it. Um, internalize however you personally feel about abortion, internalize the discussion that's going on right now if you are anticipate ever needing it for a story. Um, you know, statistically, if you have 20 characters in your story and it's not all men, at least one of them, if you said it in modern day, will have had an abortion. And that's something to think about. Um, you know, statistically, um, at least one of them will have had this experience or that experience. And so that's something that you can bring to those characters is, is actually listening to not even necessarily participating in because you may not have a ton of new ideas or information to offer, but that's okay. That doesn't mean you can't come listen to the discussion and hear what's going on. Um, and, and you should be, you should be doing that. There's tons on Elon Musk's Twitter, um, on Zuckerberg's Facebook, which I have been kicked off for talking about needle felting this week, which is great. Stabby, stabby. Um, watch YouTube demonetize me. Anyway, I mean, it, it literally, it's, it's a needle and you, you put it in felt. It's not like, I mean, I guess you could put your eye out with it. Um, so we're back to, this is the architecture of your story. There's, there's a historical thing that I want to like jump in and talk about real quick. I keep like putting things in front of the actual talk here, but it's all important stuff that you need to bring to your job as, you know, the, the building inspector, the, the guy who checks the blueprints. Um, there is a lot of poor world building out there. And I'm not mad at it. Some of it's a lot of fun. Um, but it propagates. And it's an issue when you see something that you've kind of seen before. Um, it should be a flag for you as a developmental editor to know what the problems were in the thing that you saw before and um, and make sure that they're, they're not showing up in this work, right? 
So, like, my favorite example of, of really just crap world building right now is Breath of the Wild. Um, and <laughs> I don't, 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 guys, I love the Zelda franchise. I am not coming for it. Um, the rivers in Breath of the Wild are a nightmare. They're like an ecological nightmare. They come from nowhere. They go nowhere. You're in the Zora homeland. Where is this lake even coming from? What are the springs in the mountains? Um, why does this river flow in a literal circle? Um, and I didn't even notice this until I was trying to replicate the map of Hyrule on my Animal Crossing island. <laughs> And all of a sudden, I was like, what the heck? This river has to flow uphill. <laughs> like, what, how does how does this even get here? I'm Here I am terraforming. Can I add some water? What, where does this water go? It doesn't make any sense. Um, so that's how crappy world building propagates, right? Like, nobody gave any thought to where the rivers come from or go or how a river works when they were building the map of Hyrule. And then suddenly I was trying to put it in my Animal Crossing Island and I was making all of the same mistakes. And because I'm literally replicating that, I can't actually, um, yes, if enough people hit me up, I will put a dream code in um, the description. Um, I'm not expecting that to happen, but if, if y'all want to see it, you can see it. Um, <sighs> Because I was replicating it exactly, I had to bring all the problems forward. You don't have to bring all the problems forward. You don't have to, uh, but you are, just know that you are, as a writer, infected. You have been told that mountain ranges can be a square. You have been told, but they, they can't. Like, look at mountain ranges. Look at the world. There's nothing that you are building on an alien world that isn't subject to the same laws of physics that we have. That's why they're laws of physics. So there's only a couple of ways to make mountains. Either there's, you know, some volcanic action and the crust splits and the magma comes up and you have mountains like the one right over there. Um, or you have some shoving and there's mountains like way over there that are made out of this shoved up rock. Um, mountains were down like the ones way, way, way over there. Yes, I'm pointing east. Um, I am on the west coast. We're talking about the Cascades, the Rockies, and the Appalachians, Appalachians in that order. Um, That's how you make mountains. That's it. That's that's all you can do. Um, if you want mountains that don't follow the rules of those mountains, you need to make a civilization that can make mountains artificially. Totally doable. 100% open to you. It's your world. As Bob Ross would say, it's, it's your world. If you want to put in a little square mountain, put in a little square mountain. Maybe it needs a little friend right over there. So put a little, you know, you know lay in a couple of clouds right up above that mountain if you get my two inch brush oh we're going to clean it um you know you can do that it is your world you can make a civilization that can make mountains um you can make a civilization that makes artificial moons so that the moons don't have to follow a lot of laws of physics they're still going to affect the tides though because it's a giant freaking gravity well up there okay like that's that's going to happen um know what having two moons does to a tide Know what having three moons does to a tide. Know what having no moons does to a tide. Um, and that brings us to the first part of our actual talk about developmental editing, which is reality. There's three things that you're looking for as a developmental editor, and this is the month where I ruin you as a reader forever. Sorry, not sorry. You are not going to be able to read a story the way that you ever read it, like openly and embracingly before, um, you're always going to start spotting these things. And 
I just, you know, when somebody does it well, it gives you an extra layer of pleasure to the story. Um, it does kind of ruin you for some stories, though. I'm not going to lie. Um, there's also, like, a lot to be said for learning to, relearning to read for pleasure um, and learning to let things go and, and, and being able to turn that brain on and off. But when you're first learning to developmental edit, Leave the brain on, um, even if it ruins a couple of books for you, you'll be able to have an interesting conversation about them, right? Um, so there's three parts. There's reality, clarity, and consistency. And when we're talking about reality, clarity, and consistency, we're still, you know, essentially we're looking at the blueprints. We're not looking at the paint on the walls of the house. We're not looking at the pictures on the walls of the house. Um, we're not looking at whether somebody has, I told you I was leaving this Christmas tree up all year. Y'all, I'm leaving this Christmas tree up all year. Um, we're not talking about that yet. And don't waste your time and don't waste the author's time trying to get the sentences right. At this stage, the most you should do grammatically is spot errors that the author is making consistently and give them a heads up so that when this comes back to you after they uh, – handle the edits, um, it'll it'll be a better manuscript and your line edit and your copy edit will go a lot smoother. So stuff like, oh, you have a ton of comma splices or, um, hey, you know, I noticed that you didn't use spell check or you have a ton of run-on sentences or the Amazon truck is outside or... Um, Speaking of reality intruding. Um, but, like, I have completely lost my train of thought. That's amazing. Um, oh, the big, the big errors that they make. So, like, talk about it. Give them one example. Like, say, oh, you have a lot of comma splices. Here is one that is very noticeable. This is how a comma splice works. Um, this is how this sentence could be corrected. If you spot these as you're as you're going through and, and cleaning things up from my edits, um, please just just go ahead and handle those because then we can have a smoother line edit and a smoother copy edit. Wow, that's that's really exciting. Whatever's happening over there, she's she's lying down barking, y'all. She's just lying there. I'm gonna put this on mute for just a second. That was the best treat throw I'm going to make all day, guys. Uh, that was great. I threw it right in her mouth. Um, so, so talk about you know line edits, and I guess we haven't we haven't really talked a lot about how edits work at the edit stage, have we? So when you get something to dev edit, what you're not making all of the edits with track changes off, and then handing the author back something that's amazing, right? Like that's not your job. Um, the author still has final approval over everything that you do. It's their story. It's not your story. Your job is not to make it your story. Your job is to make the story the author is trying to tell the best it can be. So turn on track changes. If you're working in Google Docs, RIP you. I'm sorry. Um, please stop. <laughs> no, that's, that's my personal hate for Google Docs. Turn on suggesting mode. Um, Use the comment function of whatever word processor, editor, anything. Um, you know, use that comment function. Highlight the comma splice. Talk about a comma splice. Send it back with changes tracked. If you are moving a ton of paragraphs, you are going to give somebody a heart attack if you are cutting and pasting. Drag them so that the moved feature can see that you moved it so that they know that it's their original paragraph, maybe with a couple edits in it, and not something new that you've put in. Um, if you are moving chapters around, consider just saying, this should go before chapter two, um, and put some stars before chapter two and say, insert 
thing from page 31 here. Talk through your changes, make your changes as visible as possible. So then when the author gets it back, they go through and they approve or don't approve your changes and they come back to you, right? They say, okay. And so you go through maybe a round or two here um, of back and forth. I think this should be moved. I don't think it should be moved. Well, they need to know this beforehand. Okay, I'll write a paragraph with that beforehand, but let's not move this. Okay, we can do that. So that's, that's how the process works at this stage. Um, so now what you're gonna communicate with that is the reality, clarity, and consistency of their story. Um, if you don't know how to talk about, and I'm gonna plug this again later in the year, how to talk about big, consistent grammatical errors that they're making, um, Purdue has the OWL, the Online Writing Lab, and we link it everywhere, um, but per, searching P-U-R-D-U-E space OWL, O-W-L, will get you to the OWL, and I'm gonna, you know, Beg Christine here to link it in the description. Um, and oh, it's owl.purdue.edu. Um, use it. If you are like me, kind of an instinctive grammaticist, grammatician, grammaticist, um, you might know that something is wrong and how to make it right, but not necessarily the language to explain to the author why it is wrong and how they can learn to make it right. And the owl will do that for you. It's better than the Duolingo owl, which just passive aggressively tells me that I haven't studied Japanese lately. Um, and then it like quietly and casually says, oh, I see that my notifications are useless. I'll stop. And then the other owl shows up like, hi, I'm Lily. Duo told me you weren't studying Japanese. So thanks. Purdue owl, good. Duolingo owl, bad. Um, <laughs> Reality, clarity, consistency. Reality is up for grabs, but it's not. So the thing about reality is, does the work follow the rules of this world, the expected rules, and if it doesn't, have you established why it doesn't, and is it consistent with those rules? So um, when we talk about reality, I use the framework in the post, who, what, when, where, why, how. So who can be aliens, can be humans, can be anthropomorphic animals, but within the confines of what is possible to be a person, a person still needs to behave like a person. Um, if you have made fish people, you need to explain why they can walk on land, how they talk. They need to talk consistent with the rules of how they're talking. Um, I specifically said fish people, fish, gills, not mammal, whale, dolphin, whatever that's actually like taking in air, but a fish with gills that is breathing water. Like, how is this fish going to make a noise? How is this fish going to communicate? Do your fish people have a well-developed sign language? If so, what do their hands look like? How do they make the signs? Are the signs reproducible by humans? Are they interacting with humans? Is it just a fish world? Um, so that's kind of the baseline. And as you're looking at this reality of who, remember that that might not look like you think it looks. So actually look up. There, there's nothing There's nothing that you're going to imagine or that your writer is going to imagine that doesn't have something at least similar at some point in human history on this world. So look at that. Um, if you are making... I don't know, fantasy sky pirate Vikings. Look at what Vikings looked like. We're not talking about an all-white culture. We're not talking about an all-seafaring culture. Viking, it's a job. Viking is a job. People had other jobs. Um, so 
look at the reality and don't forget to include all of it. Don't just like casually write people out of history or casually write them out of the future. If you have a future, everybody that's here should be in it. Unless you've established a genocidal event, um, in which case, honestly, that seems kind of lazy. Um, it's, that was judgy? No, I'm, I'm sticking with it. I stand by it. Genocidal events are lazy. They're a way of getting out of writing diverse cultures into your future. And um, you can do better than that. You can, you can learn and, and stretch and write. And if your writer has had a genocidal event in their story, you might encourage them to not. But even like within a single culture, if you want to write single culture, think about what a culture is. Think about like, is this an ethnic group? Is it an affinity group? Um, how, how are people put together? put all of the people into the world. Don't just make a world where everybody looks the same. That's not, you can literally look around you and know that that is not realistic. Even on your fish people world, not all your fish people are going to look the same. And it's not just going to be a variation between species, right? Like there's a bunch of different trout, right? And there's still like, they would all be trout, but because of where they're from, you know, a brook trout is not a brown trout, is not a steelhead. Um, steelheads, the Vikings of the trout world. Um, <laughs> they go to sea, they come back, they have babies. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, now that I've, you know, totally cast my childhood under the bus. Um, so who? Is who realistic? Is what realistic? Are the technologies and the ecosystems appropriate? Are you making a world that has one ecosystem, like one, just one, really? Think about how that works. Think about how it affects the world. We have a ton, there's a ton of research out there that talks about what a world with one ecosystem would be like. Look it up, use it, use it. People have done this work for you. Um, embrace that reality. Um, do, I've got an editor friend that, uh, He's, he's trying to make fetch happen with 30 seconds of research. Um, I am in favor of 30 seconds of research, less in favor of fetch. Um, do TSOR. Do at least enough research into what your author is trying to do to know if it's realistic or not, to know if this is how a steam engine works. Are they putting in an appropriate fuel into their steam engine? Um, is the output reasonable for that technology? Can you actually power an entire city on one generator, Master Blaster? No, you cannot. Um, so work with that. Look, look at what's around you. Do that little bit of research. Um, and you're going to find some really cool stuff. There's super cool stuff out there. I, the example I always go back to, and I know this is in the post, and I know, but it makes me mad every time I think about it. This author was writing a story set in Central America um, that was like a, a flashback to history, and this thing happened, and then the modern day people had to come back and, and look at it. But in the flashback into history, this author put the Aztecs in silk which like, um, no, like if you think for 10 seconds about where silk comes from, um, you will know that, that can't be. So you look up what an Aztec actually, clothing made out of hummingbird feathers, you guys. They missed the chance to put hummingbird feather cloaks in this story in favor of putting in something that the average reader knows is wrong. And so all of a sudden you've destroyed your entire credibility for the story. That's what we're talking about. Reality. What your job is when you're looking at reality is what is going to shatter the willing suspension of disbelief that a reader needs to stay engaged with this story? 
have you made airships that people know will fall out of the sky? Um, it's okay to have hand wavy technology. You don't have to, you know, and your author certainly doesn't have to know exactly how the power system for their, you know, wells works on their desert planet. But, um, but they need to know that there needs to be wells and a power system, right? You can't just have like spurting fountains in the desert because then you're like Las Vegas and you're just throwing all this water into the air. And then the Los Angeles River is just a crater and they drive in it in Terminator 2 and it's all very sad. Um, so where? Are your settings appropriate for the plot and for the world that you've built? Um, Again, just use use your real world examples. What does a city that's in a jungle look like? Um, I lived in Poland for a while um, in the 90s. And one of the things that we talked a lot about was how Poland uh, throughout history was a couple of hundred years behind the trend. And then they would try to catch up frantically. And you can see this in the architecture, and you can really see it in the architecture of the castles. So at one point, there's this trend for Italianate architecture, which is these big, wide, like, breezeways and colonnades and, um, you know, stuff to let air in and, and provide shade. And this is all developed in you know, in Italy, in a Mediterranean climate where it's, it's warm, there's a lot of sun, you need to be protected from a lot of sun. And so they bring this architecture up to Poland. And the first thing that they have to do is they have to adapt it because there is not, it turns out, a lot of sun in, in, in Krakow. And um, so the colonnades are suddenly like three times as high. And you have these tall windows that are spaced exactly right so that the sun can still come in, but you still have the look of that architecture. And so comparing that Italian architecture to the architecture in Italy at the time when they were importing these architects back and forth, um, you can see what the different climate does to the same structure. And think about that as you're examining your world building. Like, you don't have to describe every building, but at some point you will describe a building. Um, if your city is entirely made of skyscrapers, look up what happened with New York and Chicago when the first skyscrapers started going up. And suddenly there was shadow on the streets. The streets were dark at noon. The sun could not get to street level. And that's now why uh, both cities, I think, have an, an offset law, ordinance, the city, it's an ordinance, um, where buildings have to be set so far apart. And then if you want to make it bigger on the bottom, you, you have to shrink it down as, as you go up so that there's like space between so that the sun can come down. Um, some of the roads are, are reoriented because, um, of course, Chicago had the Great Fire, which let them kind of get do-overs on a lot of their city planning, um, which, you know, I don't want to make light of the Great Chicago Fire, but also it was an architectural boon to the city in that they got to take a lot of the structures that were not going to make it into and through the 20th century and redesign the city as a modern city at the time. Um, so that is also a thing that happens to cities. So think about that. When you're making the map of your cities, look at something like Seattle where you have two competing developers who hate each other so much that the streets don't run the same direction past a certain line. That's great. That's fantastic. That is a thing that happens in cities. Um, look at hostile architecture. Look at hostile um, development. If your character is very wealthy because you've chosen to remove some of the obstacles to the plot by making them incredibly rich, looking at you, Batman, um, think about where they live. 
you can't put stately Wayne Manor in Gotham City. It has grounds. You know, it's going to have, depending on which canon you have, it has at least a huge front lawn, possibly an orchard, some greenhouses, a gazebo. There might be a fountain. You can't, you literally cannot put that in a city, but you can put it out in a specific, like an enclave suburb where the very, very rich people are. And then think about what those look like. If you're building this on an alien world, what is going to be important? What is going to be prioritized? Um, rich people are probably still going to want the best views. So whatever the best views are in your alien city, if you've built a city that is entirely built on rock spires and hoodoos, who lives where? Who gets you know, who gets to live in the cliff that looks out over the city? Who gets to live on the spires? Are you drilling into the spires? Do people live below? Is there an undercity where there's less light? Um, and then we're back to New York and Chicago, right? So think about that. Think about who gets to live where. Um, so that brings us to when. And when is, when is two parts? One, when did when did they set it? Do your T S O R, right? Like do do your research. Know that Silk hadn't made it to Central America in prehistory. Um if somebody wants to correct me on that, I can stop being angry at this book that I read when I was literally seventeen years old. Um feel free, cite your sources. Um and then there's an internal question about when. And we're going to talk about that a little bit when we get to clarity in ooh, about 20 minutes left. We're okay. Um, so when we get to clarity, we're going to talk about timing in your story. Who knew what when? Do your events follow each other in a logical order? Or are you putting the effect before the cause? Um, why? Not to sound like a two-year-old, but Why? Do events in your story happen for a logically consistent reason? Is your bad guy bad because he's bad? I'm bored already thinking about that, right? Um, why is this city blowing up? Why did we go to the alien world? Why are we mining here? Um, why is capitalism still a thing? Why is this still a thing? Um, If you can't figure out as an editor any reason for something to happen other than, well, I guess the next thing in the story couldn't happen unless the car exploded, um, but I don't know why they would blow up the car. It doesn't make any sense. What they want to do is kidnap the person, not kill them. Um, so suddenly we've, we've blown up a car. I'm, I'm very comic book today, guys. I'm, I'm sorry. This is a super violent chat. Um, go to the author and suggest that either they change that event to something that's rational 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 for the story as presented or that they put in some backstory that makes it rational those are the two options the third option uh is leave it as it is because the rest of the story can't happen without it even though it doesn't make any sense your job as an editor is to make the third option as unappealing to the author as possible um, sometimes you're going to lose that fight. <laughs> Pour one out for you. Um, and how. Why and how are, are tangled, right? Like, how is very nebulous. How do people travel? How do people buy things? How do people get food? Does your world have grocery stores? Does it have one mega store? Do people order for delivery? How do people get food? How, you know, if you look at Pompeii, right, which we have incredibly well preserved, we're looking at the houses, there's no kitchens. There's almost no kitchens. How did people eat? Well, they ate street food. And so we have all of these street food carts and stalls and things, tremendously well preserved, answering the question of, but how? <laughs> but how? Um, for people in the U.S. and Canada, um, we're used to having a giant refrigerator. Like, 
it's so big. It's like it's four feet wide and it's eight feet tall and you can stick your arm in it and, and you have to stick your arm all the way in it to touch the back and you've you got something sticky from the shelf on your forearm now and you're digging around for the peanut butter. Um, when I was living in Europe, a refrigerator fits under the counter. That's, that's all. That's, that's what's expected. So how, how do people eat? How do people store food? Do your people feel the need to refrigerate eggs? or butter, or bread. That's still kind of a, a US mystery to me. I may just not have lived someplace that makes sense to refrigerate the bread for preservation. Um, but why, why is your bread in the refrigerator? Take that out of the refrigerator. It's gonna get like wet in there, stop. Um, how much time does it take to get someplace? How do dolls become haunted? <laughs> um, how did this person get this house? Um, if you look at you know popular media, Friends takes a lot of crap for being like basically six unemployed people, un underemployed people in New York with like this amazing flat. Um, they had incredible living spaces. Think about the living space that your character could afford. And if they're not in that living space, how did they get it? Um, how does magic work in your world? How does tech work? How much tech do you have? And if you have less tech or more tech, how did it get that way? So this, this is huge world building questions, right? Um, they're not just authorial questions. The questions for you as the editor, if you encounter a piece of technology or a magical action or something that, that is not readily explainable by the physics of the world we're in, See if you can figure out how it happened. Did the author put in enough rules for it to happen? If they didn't, your job is to put that how in there, is to identify where that how belongs. Um, can it come up in expository dialogue? Can it come up as a little info dump? Can it, does, is it fine to just put in like half a sentence where the explosion happens and, and tell people how info works? Um, how? And how kind of brings us to the second, I'm sorry about the first stage being so long, the second stage of dev edits, um, which you do at the same time as the first stage because you don't want to read this book more than once. Um, clarity. How does it happen? Can you figure out how it happened? Is there enough information in there? Conversely, are you overwhelmed with information? Did the author put every single bit of every, they've got two dozen characters and every single one of them has a 20 page backstory and a flashback and I'm looking at you, William Goldman, The Princess Bride is a great book. Um, but the Goldman version, as well as the S. Morgan Stern version could use a little editing now. Um, You don't have to have a five chapter flashback every time you introduce a new character. You can, that's a thing that people do. And again, it can be done well. You can sell a zillion copies and get made into an immensely popular movie, clearly. <laughs> but, um, and I do, I do love The Princess Bride. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not trying to crap on anybody's childhood, um, except mine, just mine. Um, but again, you know, choices are made. Goldman picks a small cast of characters. You have Inigo, you have Fezzik, you have Nazini, you have the Man in Black, and you have um, Buttercup. And that's that's pretty much it. And that's, that's few enough characters that you can pack all that backstory in. Um, he looked at how do I pack in the backstory of Florin and Gilder and said, let me give a big summary while I'm talking about how much I hate S. Morgan Stern's writing. And we'll just slide that into a chapter and keep it charming and talk about my dad reading to me. And here's what he skipped. And here's the list of things that you actually do need to know um, that I'm cutting out when I'm reading it to my kid, um, except that, he can't have because the story makes no sense without it, um, which was very, it's a very artful way to handle it, frankly, um, as a way to get that summary in. If you need to cut things for length, having one character tell it to another character as a summary, 
smooth. It's got like super washed out. The sun is like coming and going and coming and going behind me because, you know, Pacific Northwest, that's what it does. Um, pacing, it, information timing. Um, a lot of people will struggle with like one type of scene, like they might struggle with their dialogue. This is another time that those top level comments, like, oh, you have a lot of comma splices, um, are going to come in handy for you. We're going to talk more about this in the character um, month, whenever that is, August maybe, September. Um, but are their characters talking consistently in voice? If they're not, this is a great time to put a note and say your five-year-old does not sound like a five-year-old. I think you need to spend some time with a five-year-old, see if you can be weird in a school for a minute. Um, do you have a friend with a five-year-old? Do you, are you in a Facebook group with parents? Um, uh, character building is in August, apparently. Fantastic. Um, if you're, if you're in any kind of a group where you have access to parents, you can get the parents to be like, oh, sure, my five-year-old would talk like that, or my five-year-old doesn't talk like that. That's also a kind of sensitivity read, right? It's, it's a person with lived experience telling you a thing that you don't have the lived, lived experience to notice. Um, a lot of people also struggle with writing fight scenes, um, with blocking, with, you know, do you know do you know enough about where the characters are to make things seem plausible can this character reach the other character to to grab them by the shirt can they not if they struggle too much you have some toys this is my bed bug and my soft bunny and set the, literally like just draw a square get some tape and plunk them down and walk them through that. And if you have to, use that as a visual for your author and say, hey, you know, I, I walked through this scene and I just, I cannot get, um, I cannot get this character close enough in my head to, to grab the other character's shirt. Can you tell me what you were thinking of how they move through this scene? Can you show me what you were thinking? Let's get some clarity here. Um, let's, let's figure out who's, who's where and what. Um, clarity also applies to the sentence structure, right? If they're writing these big, lush, run-on sentences, not run-on, they could they grammatically complex. I can write a paragraph, like a, a non-trivial length paragraph that is one sentence that makes sense, that has punctuation, that follows all of the grammatical rules, and you will be so lost by the time you get to the end of that paragraph. You're like, but what was this about? And so this is the time to look for those and even sometimes say, hey, look, uh, your sentences are correct. There's no grammatical errors here. But you know you're writing for like 12 to 15 year olds, right? Like don't, obviously don't talk down to them, but they may not actually want to read James Joyce's Ulysses. They they may actually want to just kind of relax a little bit in their reading and follow the plot. Um, is your vocabulary appropriate to your audience? Is it not appropriate? Is it appropriate to the style of the book? Um, are words used correctly? If If they're trying to write in this steampunky voice or, or antique voice or they have a character who's supposed to be super duper duper smart take a look and make sure that the words mean what what they think they mean and if it's a consistent problem where they're using large words that are just a little bit off um, remind them there's no transitive property of synonyms um, whisper and shout are both synonyms for talk if you find them in the dictionary they mean wildly different things don't just chase that rabbit hole look the word back up um, that's going to be a you problem later when you get to the line and copy edit stage so if you can convince the author at this stage to handle it for you you are ahead of the game trust me on this one um, so reality and clarity we talked about consistency um, 
this is such a mess for me because I love so many things that are so inconsistent. Like, I don't know if y'all have ever looked up what the timeline is for the Zelda games. Um, it's a mess. Uh, there's like the child series and this series and that. And, um, and if they ever bring out Breath of the Wild 2, you guys, I'm going to die waiting for this video game. Um, they ever bring out Breath of the Wild 2, that would be really ironic if I did die. I'd try not to, I promise. Um, you know, which which series is that going to fit into? I love Resident Evil. There is a different backstory for Alice in every single movie. Um, you can make them be consistent because they are the backstories that Alice would have known at the time. And so you knowing them is you seeing this movie from her perspective. Um and then you learn more, and then you learn more, and then you learn more. But it's it's not actually consistent. It has huge, huge continuity issues. Um, you know, what does the T-virus do? Really, what does it do? Um, I love Batman, too. And, I did, you know, this is the point where I contest that I am not into the MCU. Um, I'm straight up Batman still. Um I've seen, I think, four movies in the actual MCU, and three of them are the Blade trilogy, and the fourth one is Black Panther. Um, <laughs> so, like, I haven't, I haven't seen any of it. Um, I appreciate what I'm hearing about them trying to keep things consistent and having reasons for continuity changes, like the whole WandaVision thing. That was brilliant. Um, anyway. Consistency in your story, however, is not negotiable. Do your best. Um, clearly, you can make beloved media without bothering with consistency, looking at you endless series of Batman reboots. But um, do better. Do better than that. Uh, do your characters, do the characters in the story know information before they act on it? Do they have enough information to be doing what they're doing? Do they have the background to be doing what they're doing? If somebody picks a lock, are they the kind of person who would actually know how to pick a lock? Are they fumbling around? If they are fumbling around and they are picking a lock, I suggest you sit down, pull out a hairpin, and actually try to do that because it is flipping hard. Um, I'm not saying that my buddy got a series of lock picks when we were in college, but I'm, I'm saying that I have – a little experience trying to pick a lock and it is not like it looks in the movies. Okay. So like actually try to do the thing or, or encourage the author to try to do the thing. So, you know, this doesn't necessarily feel realistic to me um, that this person could do this with this amount of experience or this amount of knowledge. Can we give them that knowledge? Um, don't, don't is a hard word. Um, if you're going to retcon after the fact, um, that's redundant because all retconning is after the fact, um, that somebody knew something, you had better be leaning into that trope real hard, Sherlock Holmes. Like, oh, I knew that, you know, this guy was not left-handed. And so when we found all of the left-handed fingerprints on the doorknob, um, then... I, I knew it wasn't this guy because it would have had to be something, something, something. Um, that had That's like one of the very few times that it's okay to use that, that trope, right? Like just, just give the character the information beforehand. Let, let them know things. People know a surprising amount of stuff. If you're, Watch it, it take 10 seconds right now and, and think about something that you are fairly confident that you could do just based on, like, having seen it in movies or having a, a, a baseline of knowledge, something that is, like, just not in your scope. Like, um, oh, I don't know, like a, inserting a trach tube. I have a friend who is 100% convinced that, that she could do an emergency tracheotomy because you see it on TV all the time, and it really is just poking a hole and inserting a tube. Um, or like, I'm pretty convinced that I could blow glass pretty well. I have a lot of the, the baseline knowledge that I would need. I've worked with hot glass. I've never blown glass. Um, would I remember not to inhale while my mouth is on the pipe? I know that I don't 
that I need to not though, which is, you know, puts me ahead of the game, right? So let your characters have knowledge. If your character is going to ad lib something, give them some skills that are relevant to ad libbing that thing before they do it. Um, make sure that the narration voice is consistent, that the, each character has their own unique consistent voice. If this character never uses contractions, go through and make sure they never use contractions. And the dev edit stage is a stage where you can start putting together, October is our, our style guides and, and cleanup session. That one I know, um, because I was talking to somebody who's really excited to, to work on the October panel. But um, this is where you start putting together your style guide. And you notice things about characters, and you notice things about buildings, and you write them down, and you say, you know, every building in this city has ivy on it. Um, the other thing about consistency is, you know, I edit for someone who shall remain nameless, but every time you leave her alone with the character description, the character's hair becomes curly, no matter how it was described before. If they're like, they tip their head back on the chair and, um, and, and she's just describing that and, and their curls flow around and over the shoulder or they catch on the chair and I'm like, character has straight hair, straight hair. Um, or, you know, they're lying in bed and their hair spreads over the pillow and in, in ringlets. No, no, you think they have straight hair. Settle down. Um, so consistency, consistency in character description. Maybe like sit here and make an actual description of each character. Uh, pro tip, you can go online and use one of the paper doll maker games to just make the characters. They don't have to like have the features perfect. Um, but you will then have an actual image of the character, especially if you're working with an author with aphantasia or you have aphantasia um, where you can't imagine this, you can check these descriptions against the physical actual picture every time you come across them and make sure that they're consistent. Um, if your story's world has internal rules, if you have magic, we've gone through how, you know how the magic works, We've been clear in describing it. Does it work the same way every time? Um, is alchemy always alchemy? Um, do you always have to make a specific gesture with your wand and say a specific fake Latin word? Um, are there times those rules are broken? Do you have rules for when the rules can be broken? Does every magic need a, I, I should use this for the wand, it's dog treat. Um, does every magic use a, a physical component? Do you have to have a dog treat to summon a werewolf? And, you know, you burn it in a fire. And every single time you have to burn something in a fire to, to summon something. And then one time, you know, maybe now the plot can hinge on, oh, and then we couldn't make a fire, right? So make those rules consistent and they will help the story. <coughs> make the reader aware of the rules, back to clarity. Um, do the readers know the rules? Do they know the stakes for failure? Do they know what happens if you don't build a fire? Um, do you know what happens if you build the fire and say the summoning spell and then throw the wrong thing in? Um, do you suddenly have like a succubus in your house when you were trying to summon like a fairy? Um, if the point of view for the story isn't omniscient, if you have a first person narrator, are you only putting information in that that, that person knows? Or are you putting in like your meta knowledge of the story? If, the, if you're using first person narration and the reader needs to know something and that character doesn't know it, you have to figure out a way for the character to gain the information. Or you're gonna have to do a point of view shift. And I have a personal like hate for point of view shifts um, just because I run across them handled poorly so many times, they can be handled well. Nio Marsh does beautiful point of view shifts where the vast majority of the book is in third person limited. Who else does this? I, maybe it's just a mystery story trope. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of, I'll, I'll think of the writer later. Um, he wrote, like skin tight, hyacinth, um, will do everything in this very tight third person limited 
talking about the investigator, the investigator, the investigator, and then they will flip for a chapter and write not necessarily like They'll, they'll go to, like, third-person omniscient so that they can refer to the person as, like, the killer or the thief and say, you know, the thief climbed down the side of the boat. And and then suddenly you can give the reader information that the point-of-view character doesn't know. So you can do it, but be aware that, like, we didn't need an entire retelling of Fifty Shades from Christian's point of view is what I'm saying. Um, that That's not necessary to the world. Um <laughs> It's not new information. Um, so, you know, if, if you're flipping between character viewpoints, have a reason. Have a reason that you have to change viewpoints. Um, there are good reasons. There are absolutely good reasons. Just do it judiciously. Um, and there's there's so many ways the story can be inconsistent and, and, and stumble over itself. In the, in the same way that I have stumbled over myself, countless times in the past hour, but now you know kind of what you're looking for. So focus on that. Focus on the reality, clarity, and consistency of the story, and then convey that information gently to the author, gently, so gently, pillows, fluff, cotton candy, have a unicorn carry it in, I don't know, just the reason that you're not doing developmental, not doing line edits at this stage is you're, you're literally asking them to throw away entire chapters. Um, you are saying, why wasn't this guy on the airship in the first place? You are saying, why wasn't this obvious? This character has all this information. Why wasn't it obvious that this was his long lost cousin? Um, they played together all the time when they were kids. The cousin is not scarred. Um, the cousin has all of this knowledge and, and is clearly coming from the place that the cousin was lost. Like, why why would he not know? How could he possibly not know? Um, does it change the story if he suddenly knows that this is his cousin? Maybe it doesn't change the story, um, but it changes the writing. All of a sudden, a bunch of scenes have to be reworked because this character has new knowledge. Um, you don't want to make darlings at this stage. Please do not make new darlings for them and then force them to throw it away. That's, that's just cruel. Um, we're not here to be cruel. We're here to make stories great. So, you know, in conclusion, um, we're here to examine the architecture of the story. We're here to examine the reality, the clarity, the consistency. We're here to make sure that this house isn't going to collapse while you're trying to paint the walls. Um, and and you can do it. And I'm sorry for how I've ruined you for books this month. Um, I'm sorry for whatever book that you are reading, which you're about to start kind of examining to say, oh, is this consistent? Is this, cl oh. Uh. And, and maybe you're having a pleasant surprise and being like, oh, this was really well edited. And, and it's fantastic and it's consistent. And I, I love seeing how the, the world building is set up and, and the timing of the information. And as you notice that in books, Take it forward into your own writing. Take it forward into writing that you're editing for other people. Start noticing those things in the books that you love, in the movies that you love, um, in the fanfic that you love, um, and, and and the memoirs and the, everything. Notice when it's done well. Figure out how it's done well, and then then you can share that, right? Like then you can you can bring that. And, and make more of that. And it's just a, an absolute pleasure to read. And, and there's so many stories out there that are so good. And I want them all to be good because I want to read them all. And uh, and I think that that's, that's really our goal, right, as editors, is to make every story a story that somebody can be enthusiastic about reading, that they don't fall out of, they don't bounce off of, um, that if it's not a genre that they want to be reading, that it's clear that it's not a genre they want to be reading so they don't engage with it and then get upset. Um, that's that's what we want to do, right? Like we want to make more stories in the world. There's there's no scarcity of ways for stories to get into the world. So let's go ahead and, and make them the best stories they can be. And I will see you next month to talk about making stories even greater. Probably, possibly. 
like and subscribe, um, obligatory YouTube, whatever I'm supposed to say, smash that bell. No, I can't. I can't even say that ironically. See you next month.